Okay, so let me um, uh, start by recalling uh, the def two definitions from yesterday. So um, we were talking about, um, we were looking at divisor evaluation, so evaluation of the form uh, order of vanishing on some divisor. So E is some divisor, some prime divisor on a resolution uh, of uh, the variety X. And uh, to that, we associated a set in the arc space of X. Essentially, these are all the arcs on X when, when you uh, lift it to Y, they have contact with E and, and then they take a closure of this set. Um, and then we defined uh, some properties of these, these other evaluations. We said that uh, the evaluation, well, E um, is a Nash valuation. If uh, this uh, set of arcs uh, from E on, 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 on the space of uh, arcs of X, uh, first of all, is contained in, in, in uh, they all go to the singularities of X, but in fact, I want to, them to form an irreducible component. So, so it will be an irreducible component of the, of the set of arcs, so the f uh, there are a maximal family of arcs, so the singularity. So this is the definition of a Nash valuation. And then uh, um, following a Nash problem, we want to understand this in terms of uh, resolution singularities. So then we say an the evaluation is essential if uh, for every resolution G of, of X, then uh, um, yeah, I look at the center of the valuation, so the image of E, if you like, uh, on, the, on the model X prime. And only in order to talk about the image, I would have to take maybe some extra blow up to map over X prime. This of the center is well defined in general. This would be an irreducible component of uh, the inverse image of the singular locus on the resolution X prime. And, and this I need to check all resolutions. And, um, and given this, then we define a Nash map called by NX. And let me just uh, describe the Nash map as an inclusion of sets. Um, as, I, as I mentioned yesterday, um, it's, not very, it's not hard to see that um, every uh, Nash valuation has to be essential, so they will give an inclusion of the, of the set of Nash valuations. We call it over X to specify inside the set, the set of essential valuation over X. And uh, the Nash problem is uh, the, the formulation, the original formulation of Nash problem is uh, is this map uh, uh, subjective? Is, uh, is it true that every essential valuation is actually a Nash valuation? And um, so I already mentioned some results last time. So the main result is uh, the, the complete solution of the, this problem in dimension two. So this is, uh, was due by Fernandez de Bobadilla and Pepe Herrera, which says uh, uh, in dimension two, the Nash map is, on, is uh, subjective. And um, I, I, as I mentioned yesterday, in dimension two, it's completely clear the, 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 what uh, the set of essential evaluations uh, is because there is a minimal resolution. Every other resolution will dominate, so it's enough to check the look at the exception divisor on a minimal resolution. It's an extremely natural class of divisors, and in fact, one proves in the end, after a lot of work and a lot of years, that in this case, all of them are actually appear as components in the arc space. So in dimension greater than three, the situation, the situation is, is more delicate. And uh, in fact, as I mentioned, um, the, the, the problem turns out to be false in general. So there are examples. So 
So we know that there are examples where the Nash map is, is subjective. And um, most notably the toric case. And, uh, but the difficulty in constructing examples here is that uh, it's very hard to understand what is the space of essential evaluations. So at least in the surface case, we start with knowing very well one or two sets. But on, uh, in high dimension, the, the set of essential evaluations is, is a delicate thing to understand. The reason is that in principle, we need to look at all resolution. So it's hard to describe. The, s the set of essential evaluations. Because, y because uh, you need to check. In principle, all resolutions. And uh, so there is no minimal resolutions. And then another typical problem that you occur in higher dimension is there are, um, for instance, uh, non-divisor resolutions, like if you say even small resolutions, sometimes. So for instance, you can have a resolution of uh, ordinary double point in dimension three, so the cone of a quadric, and uh, where you, instead of blowing up uh, the point, you blow up a line, and this act, uh, so you blow up a plane, and this actually gives up uh, a small resolution. The exceptional locus is not a divisor, so you don't even see, you might not even see one divisor on the resolution, so we need to be a little bit careful about these things. So the point is that, uh, and as I will show in the, in, the, in, the, in, my, in, the, in the example coming up, in the notion of essential divisors in, in dimension three and higher, in fact, particularly in dimension three, it's, it's, it's kind of subtle. And maybe it's saying that that's not the right thing to look at. And in fact, the theorem here, and this theorem is actually a collection of three theorems. So the first one is a theorem by Ishii and Kola. Then there is a theorem in, uh, by myself, and then a theorem by Johnson. And Kola is that in general, in all dimensions, greater than three, there are examples um, where the Nash map is not subjective. So I will um, describe an example. So maybe let me say, I mentioned in words, uh, this theorem is actually is, uh, maybe about 10 years ago, and uh, these are more recent. Um, so Ishii and Kolare came out with a, an example, with a uh, particular example, um, a familiar example, but in, in their argument to understand the condition of being essential, um, they actually use a very interesting property. So somehow they construct an example where some divisor is, a, is, a, is uniruled, but is not ruled. And uh, so for that to be true, you need to go in dimension four so that uh, the, the divisor is at least a threefold. So you have an example like that, because on a surface, this would never occur. So somehow the, the construction really works just in dimension four and higher. So for some time it was open. And uh, so what they did is actually following uh, their construction, but come out with a different way of thinking about uh, essential evaluations and uh, try to find uh, new arguments for that. And, um, and then, uh, uh, Collar, uh, Johnson and Collar, then uh, they actually realize that uh, these kind of sporadic examples, in fact, co by combining these arguments, these sporadic examples can actually, going back to work actually of Nash, they can actually make into uh, uh, more common families of examples. Like the so maybe just say, before I describe the example, at this point, what one need to rephrase the problem. Okay, so we'll come back to that in a moment. So
So let me now discuss uh, the example. So I will discuss uh, uh, my example. So an example in dimension three. Uh, but I, I really stress the fact that uh, the, the, the general outline of the construction really goes back to the idea of Ishen Kolar, but the arguments are, are different to three, the three dimensional case. So the idea is, that, is to have to look at a, a two blow up resolution. Okay. Um, so, of, of a, say, a isolated threefold singularity. So, you start from X here. So, X is a threefold, and as this isolated singularity uh, at the origin, um, you block one time, and you get this new model. We call it Y, up F. And uh, so, this uh, will extract one divisor, which I will denote by E. So, the first blow up. And a reducible divisor, um, but this, the, 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 the threefold Y is still singular as one singular point, which of course will lie on the exceptional divisor. Let me call it P. And then I blow up a second time, and I construct a new, uh, new model. We call it Z. And uh, so here we'll have the, the, the exceptional divisor E, maybe the proper transform of it. And then another divisor, which I'm going to picture actually in this way, which turned out to be a quadric. So let me call it F. So F sits inside um, P3 as a smooth quadric. So how do we realize this? You start from a, a, a singularity of multiplicity 3. And uh, after you blow up, the singularity P will be a multiplicity 2. In fact, if I want to realize the, the second blow up as a smooth quadric, that would be exactly like a cone of a, of a quadric, at least uh, locally analytically. And uh, so something like this is called an ordinary double point. So a local equation would be something like xy equal to uh, zw. Hmm. It would be the local equation. In particular, it's a multiplicity 2. And uh, so you notice that, uh, well, the first blow up, I can realize this uh, as whatever I want, but I will realize this as a relative Picard number one. So I need to be more careful about the Picard number of the map G. You see that the exception divisor F actually has Picard number two. So the question is, is the Picard number two actually uh, lift to X to, to, to Z or not? So the, is the relative Picard number is two or not? And this really, really depends. It's not just a local statement. It will depend on the global geometry of of Y. So you can realize this uh, in a way that the two rulings on the quadric are actually numerically equivalent inside the threefold Z. And if you do that, then the relative Picard number is one is one here. And this amounts to say that Y. You can realize this as the white is actually locally Q factorial. In the Zariski topology. Okay. So we can uh, this is uh, the starting point of the of the of the problem. You notice now though that uh, this local equation of singularity, uh, analytically speaking, this is just a cone of a quadric, and that definitely is not uh, Q factorial. Because uh, uh, just the ruling of, one of the, the quadric, one ruling of the quadric will give you a, a divisor, which is uh, no hope to be uh, uh, Cartier or Q Cartier. And this is reflected by the fact that an uh, uh, ordinary double point can always locally be give, resolved by small resolution. So what I want to say here is that there exists a map here on some new model, um, we call it Y tilde, where this is a small analytic resolution. So the Y tilde exists in the, in the analytic category, but does not exist in the algebraic category. 
So this is uh, analytic, but not algebraic. Because uh, the exceptional locus here is a curve, we're going to denote by C tilde, and this curve maps down to a point, so a, a small, a, the image of a small resolution will never be factorial in the category in which the resolution is defined. So this uh, threefold is Q factorial in the Zariski topology, but it's not Q factorial in analytic topology, and this is really the key uh, observation. Um, another thing I notice here, with, uh, is not hard to realize, is that the proper transform of the exception divisor, E tilde, we actually contain exceptional locus, uh, C tilde. So, now let's conclude. I want to conclude uh, uh, something about uh, Nash valuations and uh, essential valuations of singularity. So the first remark is that the existence of a small resolution like this will tell me that there is only one irreducible component in the arc space. So I compute this analytically. Uh, but that's fine, because the definition of arc space is not really sensitive for which category I'm looking at, because you can just look analytically locally, even complete, and, uh, and compute the fiber on arc space. that will be the, just the same fiber. So the existence of this resolution, this implies that the, that the set of arcs of the singularity has only one component. It's only one component. And uh, so on the other end, my claim is that, uh, um, I want to say, is that uh, the valuation associated to F is essential. Okay, so if this is true, then F would be an, an essential valuation. It's not an S valuation because uh, the, the component of uh, coming from F actually is contained in the, in the component coming from E. So how do you check that? So, so suppose the center um, of S, the valuation along F, or along some resolution X prime, is contained strictly in, inside uh, uh, an irreducible component of the inverse image of the single locus of X. So what does it mean? I'm assuming that there is maybe some other resolution, I'm going to picture right here, some other resolution, X, X prime, and, uh, and the center of this valuation is a strictly contained in a component on the inverse image of zero. So but now let's compute a little bit of uh, invariance here. So because this is multiplicity three, one, one thing I notice here is that the discrepancy of E is equal to zero. And this is multiplicity two, and this is discrepancy zero, so it's, I check the discrepancy here of F is equal to one. So this com discrepancy computation, and if you don't know about this, uh, the definition of discrepancy, I will actually give it uh, tomorrow or in general. <laughs> Um, but this, computer, uh, this discrepancy computation, essentially the vanishing of the Jacobian on the map, is saying something about this, the, the, this, the size of this center. This center cannot be co-dimension two, it has to be at least a curve. And, but it's containing something, so it cannot be more than a curve. So actually, this is actually equal to a curve. See, a curve. And by Jacobian formula, the only reducible component uh, has to be a divisor. The only divisor that can contain C must have discrepancy zero. And this one is the only divisor with discrepancy zero. So this C must con be contained inside the proper transform of E. So there is proper transform of E here, and C is right here. C maybe C is uh, E prime. So the picture looks very similar to the picture I draw here. And in fact, uh, the next step is to show that essentially it is the same picture. So I'm realizing algebraically something that I know cannot exist. And, uh, the point is that now I, can, I, I try to understand this rational map. Uh, I have this rational map, and um, you know to understand this rational this is um, given that they blow up the maximal ideal. So the maximal ideal, the order of vanishing along f is one. So I already vanished one times along e prime, so I cannot vanish more than one times along c. So this means that when I pull back the maximal ideal, 
it will be locally principal at generic point of C. So this means that this map is actually well defined as a generic point of C. But then you get a contradiction because now you get something. You, you see that uh, this map is called H. This map is well defined as C along C, and C uh, is going to be an exceptional component of this map. So you see that H is, is well defined at a generic point of C. And so, and so you, this implies that the, the exceptional, the C is an irreducible component or the exceptional locus of H, maybe by taking further blow ups outside the generic point. But then uh, this implies, uh, this contradicts fact, uh, the fact that uh, Y is factorial. Again, it's the same kind of problem, right? Because you take an ample divisor cutting across C, take the image over here, and it will not be Q Cartier. So, and this is how the argument goes. So let me just mention, maybe, that um, if you want uh, using actually um, so the last example, maybe the one that Johnson and Colla uh, computed in the end, they show that in fact this uh, failure is a pretty common uh, phenomenon, is, uh, has to do with C1 singularities, C CA1 singularities. So I'm going to say that maybe just a three-dimensional case of the, of the theorem. So these are compound A1 singularities. So a singularity, after you cut down one time with other plane class, you get uh, uh, A1 singularity. And uh, so this looks something like x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus t to the m equal to zero. And if you take m at least four, then they prove. The funny thing is that this actually was already in, uh, in Nash's paper. So Nash already gives some condition on uh, how many uh, Nash valuations are there. He doesn't really conclude it. Uh, but he um, noticed that I lost one or two, and in fact, they proved it's always only one. On the other end, it turns out that if m is odd, then there are two essential valuations, and, and the argument is very similar to this one. So it means that if you look at m greater than four odd, so I, was, I could say m greater than five, then these are counterexamples. And now you see that, in fact, this is a, these are very simple singularities. And um, so in a way, it's kind of interesting that uh, already in Nash paper written down there, there was already written a counterexample. It just uh, wasn't sh uh, uh, didn't compute it all the way. So. So we need to, um, given these examples, we want to rephrase the problem. So we want to uh, we look at this map, the map from the Nash valuations into essential valuations, and now we want to come up with a, a way of describing the image. So let me just say Nash problem. Revisited. You describe the image of the Nash map. And uh, so you need to come up with uh, a new way of uh, characterizing some interesting divisors among the essential valuations and, uh, and try to see which one are in Nash map, how uh, they fill up the whole Nash map, and so on. So I want to consider the following. Um, I want to consider the following uh, definition. Evaluation associated to divisor E is terminal over X. <coughs> and this is in with respect to the minimal model program.
if um, the divisor E appears as an exception divisor on a minimal model, y over x. So <coughs> again, uh, if you are not familiar with the minimal model program, I will outline a little bit about, uh, uh, about the minimal model program tomorrow. Or I guess not tomorrow, um, on Thursday. Um, but just think about the case of a surface. In the case of a surface, the minimal model program is a, the program that allows you to contract you know, minus one curves all the way to the minimal model. And uh, the idea is that if you start with an arbitrary resolution of a surface, you start contracting minus one curves, uh, you end up, I mean, re which are exception over x, you end up with a minimal resolution. So the minimal model in, uh, in dimension two is just a minimal resolution. So from the point of view of uh, the theorem in dimension two, this is actually a natural, very natural thing to look at. So in general, what minimal model means is two properties that are key in the proof of what I'm gonna state next is the fact that first of all, why in higher dimension, why in, on the surface case, why will be smooth? But in higher dimension, I need to allow some singularities to run this uh, MMP. So I want y to be um, uh, as smooth as possible and, the, def and the, the condition is that y has terminal singularities. So it means, means at most, of course, it could be smooth. Um, and again, I will give a definition on Thursday of terminal singularities. The second property will be more key, uh, key for understanding what I talk, talk about today is that if I look at the canonical class, or so canonical divisor on Y, I want this to be uh, relatively Neff over X. So it intersects uh, non-negatively every exceptional curve uh, of Y over X. So let's see. So I, I, now I can say the theorem. So the theorem, this is by myself and Ocampo. So he said the following way. Every um, terminal valuation is a nice valuation. So in a way, this is giving a description of a subset of the Nash valuation. So I can look, so I'm interested in understanding Nash valuation over X. I already know that these are contained inside a set of essential valuations. And now what I'm proving is that there is another set, a set of terminal valuation. <laughs> which is contained inside here. So in a way, this theorem is a sort of complementing uh, the theorem of, um, of uh, the observation by Nash. And so now this, this set of interesting valuation that are mysterious to us is now is, is squeezed in between two sets that we can actually understand very well. I mean, potentially speaking, of course. Um, so, What we get out of this picture, we first of all, we get, we get a new proof of the theorem of uh, Fernando de Bobadilla and Pepe Herrera. I also we get some new examples. Where uh, the Nash map is subjective. For instance, if uh, X has, has uh, what is called a crepant 
this is our evaluation. So I'm not getting too much into this, but let's just say there are some quotes and singularities. For instance, there's the kind of quotes and singularities we generalize uh, rational double points. Um, the one typically that you would like to see in the McKay correspondence, for instance. In that case, uh, uh, the theorem would say something about that. Um, uh, so, so she's asking about if, if I'm assuming X is a Q factorial, Q Gorenstein, and the answer is no. So this is a completely general, not assuming X to be normal. Um, So the point is that I run MMP over X, but on, on the resolution, say, transform resolution. So, let me maybe make a, a remark, maybe, let me make a remark. Okay, so there is another, <laughs> natural set. or the set of Nash valuations, which is a set, the set of, uh, of uh, minimal valuations. So the point is that uh, this is with respect to the relative partial order so the idea is that uh, at least if, let me work locally at a, when you look at a single point and so in the local ring you have two valuations on this ring and you can actually test whether one is always greater than the other you you yes i will um, so you know just a partial order of evaluation we greater than another evaluation by prime so i mean this by just testing on regular function you need to be a little careful about the fact that you look at local rings so center at the you know at the center of one or two evaluation and so on but uh, there's an obvious or partial order and um, um, when you look at the minimal elements under this partial order and then uh, you see if you have a, a, a if one set contains the other set, then this means, this implies that the evaluation along E is, is gonna be less or equal evaluation along, uh, along F. And the reason is just because this valuation, uh, they can be measured by order of, uh, of contact with arcs on this set, and uh, there are some semi-continuity on the order of contacts that vary the arc. And so I get uh, clearly, I'm gonna quite uh, like this. So this means that I also have another set here, this um, minimum evaluations. Also, this depends on the base model, also over X, and this is clearly contained inside the set of Nash evaluations. And uh, so the interesting thing about uh, looking at all, all this inclusion is the following. So there are two cases where uh, we actually know the Nash, two general family of examples where we know the Nash map is, is uh, surjective. And um, one is a Tory case, another one is a surface case. And uh, so how do we prove the surface case? If you like, uh, by just looking at, at following, for instance, from this statement, the point is that I have these two inclusions, and on a surface case, essential evaluation, evaluation of minimal resolution, is the same as a terminal model, minimal model, so it's clearly that these two sets are the same. So in the surface case, it follows because essential evaluations, so because terminal evaluation is the same as essential. And, um, but if you look at the toric case, which I've not discussed very much, it turns out that you don't need to look at the, the term evaluation, but in fact, it's enough to look at the minimum evaluation. So the, again, because of the squeezing, it will imply that uh, the evaluations are the same. 
I mean, there's, uh, Nash and Essential are the same. But the funny thing is that if you look at surface case, minimum valuations actually is a, typically a smaller subset. Conversely, if you look at the toric case, the terminal valuation is typically a smaller subset. So what, what happened is that, that we know this theorem to be true in these two cases for two very different reasons. And somehow this different reason come from these two families, from these two collections of valuations. They seem to complement uh, each other somehow in this kind of problem. And, uh, and one can you know, ask uh, how much of this actually holds in general, which I really don't know. Okay, so for the remaining part of the talk, I would like to give an idea of the proof of the theorem uh, stated above. Um, in particular, if you can, you can think about working with a surface, and that will, will give a proof of, uh, of the, of the two-dimensional case, which is different from uh, the original one. But the starting point of the proof, this actually is the same, is common in, I guess, uh, most of the approaches to what this problem. And it goes, it goes back to the idea of uh, Legend Jalabert. So let me talk about that. So let's talk about a sketch. So throughout the here now, let me go denote by the n the dimension of x. Let me assume it's greater equal than 2. Um, so again, suppose. There is some divisor E or some resolution. So, uh, sorry, on some minimal model. So, there is a minimal model, then there is a prime divisor on this minimal model such that when I look at this uh, set of arcs coming from E, this is contained inside. Uh, um, the, the, the arcs of the singularity of X, but it's strictly contained into all components. So, I mean, it's not an irreducible component. Suppose that this is not an irreducible component. Okay. Um, so, what I'm going to do next, I'm going to fix a point. P inside E, of course, E lies inside Y. So if, um, if uh, I'm in dimension 2, that would be just a, a close point, a normal user point. But if in dimension 3 or higher, then actually I want to take P to be a non closed point, some point actually which has got dimension 2 in, in Y. So what I want is, uh, uh, I want the, so the dimension, let me say of dimension. Uh, equal to n minus 2. By this, I mean that you look at the residue field um, as an extension over C, and you want the transcendental degree to be equal to n minus 2. Like a schematic point. Uh, think about being like, a, for instance, some sort of a, like a curve in dimension 3, for instance. Okay, so here is the, kind of the key, the key um, technical uh, lemma. So you've got a curve selection lemma. So, so go back to Legion Jalabert and uh, prove in general by Regera. And uh, and then uh, I uh, we're going to need some specialization of the original statement. Uh, so let me say this. Uh, so this is a bit uh, technical, but let's try to get an idea of what this says. So first of all, there is a finite extension uh, k 
of, of, the, of the rest of the field at the point P. And, uh, and there is a map phi from spec k, double bracket s. So it's going to be an arc. But this arc is not going to be on x. It will be an arc on the arc space of x infinity. Uh, with the following property. So the first property I want is, uh, so again, the, 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 spe the spec of this, uh, this is like, again, a germ of a, of a, of a, of a curve over, the, over k. And uh, so I look at the close point, and then I will look at the generic point. I will say something about the generic point. OK, so the close point, uh, where the close point will be a, a k-valued point on x infinity. So let me call it alpha 0. So I want this to be an arc which actually lies inside the, this uh, set associated to E. So maybe I start a picture here. So suppose that this is the inverse image of the singular locus of x. So this subset is an arc space of X. And uh, somewhere here, there is uh, this set, an E. So an E, I draw it uh, like a bit thin, because it's not an irreducible component. So it's a sort of a set of limit points in some sense, right? Um, so we kind of uh, in, the, in the closure of the complement. So what I'm going to do is that I pick a point alpha 0, which belongs to this set and E. And uh, so I want this, the, 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 this to be, to be an arc on this space, such that it starts from there, but when I move at uh, time eta, so the generic point, actually will not belong. I call it alpha eta. This will be an element in the, single, in the, inverse, in the set of arcs of the singularity, but not in E. So in a way, I'm drawing an arc phi coming outside. And uh, so this is what I want. Um, in fact, I want a little bit more. I want to be a little bit more precise about this arc. So this arc comes from uh, um, the arcs that have contact with E, at least in the closure of the set. So let me be more precise. If I look at the lift, I want this lift at 0 to pass to E, and I want this to do, to do it with order of contact. OK. So I will draw a picture in a moment, and then the picture, I think this condition will be very clear. OK, so this is what we want. Um, What is that? Pardon? Oh, well, so um, I want this arc to be uh, going to go through the singular locus, but it's not going to be entirely contained in singular locus. So as I explained yesterday, there will be a unique lift to the resolution, to the minimal model. So as a unique lift to the minimal model, I, I, the picture will draw, probably in, in that blackboard, will actually clarify the construction. Yes? Uh, just to be sure to understand, if you resolve the singularity just by one blow up, in this case, N E is equal to uh, inverse image of the singular locus. That, that's correct. So I'm assuming. I, okay, maybe uh, I should uh, be more clear about this. So I want to prove a statement that there is an inclusion like that. So I'm assuming. I want to go by contradiction. So I'm assuming that that statement is wrong. So this means that we'll be able to find some divisor E which is uh, in the mineral model, so it gives me a minimum valuation, but it's not giving me a Nash valuation. OK, so let's see what we do now. So let, f let me first make a remark here. This is actually kind of important. So how do you prove a statement like that? In a notarial setting, this actually is a pretty straightforward theorem. I mean, just so suppose that we are working with a close point and everything. Even there, the, the theorem is very delicate. 
how do you prove it in that case? You just start cutting down with hyperplane sections until you cut down to a curve, you normalize it, take a parameterization. And uh, if you do generically, you can make sure that this hyperplane section we're going to cut across. But the point is that this set here is non notarian So this is a sad, this is a... <laughs> this is a delicate um, uh, property for, uh, uh, in, the non in the non notarian setting. For instance, it's easy to construct examples where you cannot do it. You just, it just simply doesn't hold. And uh, a good example is uh, to work out is uh, using the Whitney umbrella and the same arc I explained yesterday. Um, but that's required a little bit of time to explain. Let me give you a more abstract example, which is actually very simple to write down and very simple to see why uh, this doesn't hold. So here's an example. Let M be the spec. You're going to take a polynomial ring with infinitely many variables. Divided by the following ideal, I look at x1 minus x to the xk to the k. k greater than 2. So there are infinitely many equations here, relations. So this sort of cut down uh, something looks like a curve. A curve that as you go up in the coordinates, it gets uh, more and more and more tangent to the, to the axis. And, uh, and if you just think for a moment in terms of order of contact, then there are no non-constant maps phi from spec C S to M such that phi at zero is equal to the origin of this, uh, of this curve. Uh, because if there was one, by looking at the Taylor expansion in various coordinates, you get a contradiction on the order of vanishing. The only way that you get something vanishing at zero is actually vanishing infinitely many times. So this is really telling us that uh, this, kind of, this kind of theorems actually are very, very difficult. A very, very, very delicate thing. So some, there's something very special about this set we are looking at here. So these are non notarian sets, but somehow, um, at least morally speaking, they are cut down by finite many equations in something which is not too bad. And uh, so this, this is what you want to exploit. Well, the point is that it's exactly the setting that we are looking at. So we're looking at this set uh, of arcs with a single locus of, of a variety. And we look at a subset which is uh, coming from the arc, coming from one divisor. So these are very special sets inside a non notarian scheme. Yeah. Okay, so now I think uh, we are ready to, uh, to conclude. Uh, where did I put the, um, here? Actually, maybe, let me add one more thing here. So there is two ways that you can actually think about this map phi, capital phi. So you can think about it as an arc on the arc space. And um, so as an arc on the arc space, you can think phi as a one parameter. family of arcs. Of course, the one parameter is form, uh, works in, in a formal disk, but uh, anyway, it's so the one parameter family. S is the parameter of the family, T will be the parameter of the arc. But in fact, I can actually also describe phi in the following way. As a map from S, which is a spectrum of capital K in two variables, ST down to X. So this is a map from something that looks like a, a germ of a surface. So this is a two-dimensional 
is a two-dimensional scheme. And um, so the relation here is given by phi of st just equal to alpha s at t, at time t. So <coughs> we, need, we want to focus on this surface. So this is really is a surface, abstractly speaking, meaning that uh, it's a dimension two scheme. So the maximum a topological set is dimension two. But the dimension two is of a capital K. Capital K has a certain degree of uh, C. So if I want to think as a variety, that looks like some sort of, sort of generic open set inside a variety, but now this will be a variety of dimension n, which is the same as the dimension of x. So this is a sort of a dual way of thinking about s as a something of dimension n and something of dimension 2. Of course, in a two-dimensional case, I can take kappa uh, k to be uh, c, and then everything will coincide. So let me now draw a picture. We have, um, we, oh, let me actually draw a little bigger. So you have x here with a singular locus, and uh, we pick up some, this minimal model, y. So minimal model in particular, the ky is net over x, and ky is going to have a bunch of exception divisor. Uh, in particular, I'm looking at one divisor, e, on this exceptional locus. On the other end, now I'm looking at uh, the surface S. So abstractly, I think about this as a surface for a moment. So I have two coordinates. I'm going to have a coordinate S and the coordinate T. And I have a map down this way, which I'm going to call capital Phi. So this capital Phi will take, for instance, uh, the parameter T to an arc, which is arc alpha 0. Alpha zero will stick out for the singularity, and it will lift to an arc alpha zero tilde, which touches E with order of contact one. In particular, this alpha zero tilde is a smooth arc on Y. Hmm. Um, Notice that now, for simplicity, uh, of course, here I only have a generic point away from the origin, but let's just say that these are convergent power series, so I really have actually a, a real one-parameter family. So as I move away, I have some other arcs here. They're going to map to other arcs on the variety, called alpha s. And that will be, be uh, like an algebraic family of arcs on x. The problem is that when I actually try to lift this up, because of my second hypothesis here, I'm actually going away from E. So these arcs alpha s, when they lift it up, they lift it up somewhere else. So somehow there is a kind of a jump. What happened is that as I deformed this, this, uh, this uh, segment all the way to zero, this arc all the way to the central arc, so in the form of alpha s to alpha zero, here there's some breaking. And uh, this amounts to say that when I look at the map phi, phi tilde going up this way, this map is not well defined. So there is some base locus, some indeterminacy locus at, at the origin. In fact, the origin is the only close point, only point of dimension two where the base locus can be. So, what I'm going to do next uh, is I'm going to try to resolve the singularities. So there are two ways of resolving singularities. There is a minimal way of just blowing up the indeterminacy. The second way, which is uh, uh, taking a, a sequence of, of point blow-ups. The advantage of the second way is to give you a, a smooth model, like a, a regular model. So let me use a second uh, uh, construction. So I'm going to take G to be uh, the minimal sequence of point blow-ups. So this, uh, as I blow up, I'm introducing new exceptional curves. And uh, what I see is, for instance, there is a proper transform of the s-axis. Then we, there will be some uh, exceptional curve like that. And then there is a proper transform of the t-axis. And now, here I get a nice map, denoted by phi, 
it is well defined. So I'm going to make, a, um, as, I, as I trace in my chain of blow ups, I can always uh, find an exceptional component, in fact, a unique exceptional component, which is going to intersect the t axis upstairs. So let me call it G. So G is this exceptional component here. And um, so I'm going to make a simplified assumption for, for, for now, just to, to finish the proof in time, which is uh, assume that G is not the exceptional and Y is smooth. Um, if it's a G is exceptional, then I will actually also to consider the blow up of the deal and I look at the both res, uh, resolutions of the map. So, and now let's make some, uh, some uh, observations. So the T axis, this, this little arc here, get mapped to the alpha zero tilde, which is a smooth arc. So what I see is the phi of the T axis is a smooth arc. So this implies something about, okay, so maybe let me just stop for a moment and say, this is the key point where I'm gonna now look at S not as a surface, but as something of dimension N of the complex numbers. So now this is uh, as the same dimension of the complex numbers as the variety Y. Of course, it's not a variety, it's, 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 it's defined over a formal scheme, so I want you to be careful about that. But treat it as a variety for a moment, so it's n-dimensional. And um, so you can actually define the ramification, because now the dualizing shift, the, 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 the shift of differentials will have the same, uh, uh, the same rank. I need to be careful about that too, but uh, in the appropriate definition. So you can define the, the, the ramification, and, and the conclusion is that phi is, uh, n is not ramified at the generic point of G. So this means that if I look at uh, KZ over Y, this is, will be the ramification divisor. Um, What I see is that order along G of KZ over Y is equal to zero. You notice because I'm assuming that Y is smooth, then of course ramification of a map between two smooth varieties is always a, uh, an effective divisor. So we have this effective divisor here. So the next thing I want to look at, so KZ over Y is a ramification of this map. Another map that I want to look at is uh, this chain of blow-ups. So I look at now at KZ over S. So this is uh, uh, what is called typically, in this birational case, this is typically referred as a relative canonical divisor. And uh, so what do we know about that? Um, the relative canonical divisor, well, you know that if you blow up a surface at a point, you get the exception divisor with, uh, with coefficient one. It's a, it's, a, it's a vanishing order of the Jacobian of the, of the blow up. So yeah, sorry, maybe I should have said, yes. This is downstairs S, and I forgot to write. This is Z. That's a, Z is a, is a blow up of S. So, what, what I see is that the, 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 the coefficient of G, say, in this divisor is given by the order of Jacobian of the map G al al along the divisor, capital G. But this is a smooth surface, so you compute very easily that this is a, is a positive number, so the Jacobian is non-trivial. So what I see is that the order along G of KZ over S is, equal, is, a, is, is, gre is greater than, than zero. You will notice because uh, the Picard group of S is trivial, this is linear equivalent to the canonical divisor of Z.
And now we're almost done. Um, so I'm going to decompose. K z over y as a horizontal part and an exceptional part where these are with respect to the map g. And now what I see is that if I look at kz over s minus the exceptional part of kz over y, well, maybe with an extra step in between, you will see that this is the same as a pullback of ky uh, plus the horizontal part of kz over y. Okay, this is a just linear uh, computation. And uh, by this theorem, now I regard z as a surface, exceptional uh, blow up of, uh, of the surface S. So what I see about this guy is that, well, this is a pullback of a NEF divisor. So this will be NEF, so it's GNEF. And this is also GNEF because it's an effective divisor, which is a trans uh, horizontal. <laughs> this divisor here, though, is, um, is uh, G exceptional. And this is the reason why I'm looking at this decomposition. Because uh, this is exceptional, and this is exceptional by the way I picked it. So if you apply Hodgkin's theorem, it follows that the left hand side is actually uh, anti effective. The point is that the, 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 the matrix, uh, the, the, uh, the, the product on the exceptional components of G is, is negative defined. And, uh, but this is a contradiction because of uh, it's a contradiction of this uh, coefficient on G. But this is impossible. And uh, so this, this uh, finishes the proof, at least in the special case of uh, my working hypothesis. Okay, so I'll stop here for today. Thank you.